Hello, everyone. My name is Sandra Clark, and I want to welcome you to the NOAA Environmental Leadership Seminar Series. The goal of these seminars is to showcase examples of the environmental leadership role that NOAA plays in our society by those who lead it and make it happen. I'd like to take a moment for a few webinar details. First, I want to thank the NOAA Science Center, excuse me, the NOAA Science Council and the awesome team I work with in putting together these seminars, without whom none of this would happen. Hernan Garcia with the NOAA NESIS National Centers for Environmental Information. Tracy Gill with the NOAA NOS National Centers for Coastal Ocean Science. And Katie Raleigh with the NOAA OAR NOAA Central Library. Second, I would like to share some seminar logistics. These are also listed in the Q&A box online. All attendees are muted. Please type all of your questions and comments into the Q&A box at any time, and we will address as many as we can at the end of the seminar. Now, if your system is lagging or audio is breaking up, Try closing any apps or browser pages you are not using to free up bandwidth space. Other suggestions for improving your webinar experience are listed in the Q&A box as well. We are recording this seminar for later viewing, and the link where it will be posted is in the Q&A box, too. Today's NOAA Leadership Seminar is, is titled, A Leadership Journey from the Depths of the Ocean to the surface of the sun, and our speaker is Joseph Pika. Joe is the deputy director of the NOAA NESDIS National Centers for Environmental Information. Joe Pika's career with NOAA spans over three decades. Since 2018, he has been the NOAA NESDIS NCEI's deputy director. NCEI provides access to one of the most significant archives on Earth. With comprehensive oceanic, atmospheric, and geophysical data from the depths of the ocean to the surface of the sun, and from million-year-old ice core records, which I would really love to see, to near real-time satellite imagery. Before coming to NCEI, Joe served as the first director of the National Weather Service Office of Observation. His office was responsible for a portfolio of space, atmosphere, water, and climate observational data that is used to support NOAA's forecasts and warnings. Prior to that, Joe served as a commissioned officer in the NOAA Corps. During his time there, he was the commanding officer of both NOAA's flagship and only global class vessel, the Ronald H. Brown, and the fleet's most technical advanced ship for deep sea exploration, the Okeanos the Okeanos Explorer. Joe has completed the leadership for the Democratic Society Program at the Federal Executive Institute and also the Senior Executive Fellows Program at Harvard's Kennedy School of Government. He has a master's degree in civil engineering from Portland State University and a bachelor's degree in general engineering from the University of Illinois. Joe is coming to us today from Asheville, North Carolina where he lives with his wife and two children. Welcome, Joe. Thank you so much for being here. We can't wait to hear about your fascinating career with NOAA. And now the mic is yours. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Sandra. Um, good afternoon, good morning to uh, everybody who's attending, depending on where you're coming from. Uh, I'm, I'm very excited to be here. I, I did want to take a, a quick moment to, to also provide my thanks to, to Sandra, uh, Hernan, Tracy, and Katie uh, for their leadership of this program and, and the ability to be here. I've been able to, to participate and listen in on some of these seminars in the past, and I, I certainly appreciate uh, them. I hope that all of you will, will find my journey uh, uh, both informative and uh, interesting as well. As Sandra mentioned, I've, I've, I've served uh, for nearly three decades 
uh, in NOAA, uh, primarily as a, as a NOAA crosser for the majority of it, uh, but also as a senior executive for the last uh, few years. And I've had uh, uh, the good fortune to actually move around quite a bit and to work uh, uh, across the entire, entire organization, hence the, the journey from the, the surface of the sun where we work with space weather uh, to the bottom of the ocean where we're de doing deep sea exploration and where I am today uh, where we're saving all the information uh, so that it can be analyzed in total in an integrated way to understand what is happening. And my, my intent today though is not to, to, to dwell on, on many of the technical issues but, but focus on my leadership journey uh, and what, what kind of insights can I provide uh, you know, based on that experience uh, over time as I look back at that career. Uh, let me start with uh, a little bit of a preamble of, you know, each of us comes to NOAA uh, with, with a background, uh, you know, family, experience, education. Uh, this photo you see here is from three years ago, and this was the 50th wedding anniversary for my parents. Um, I happen to be the eldest of nine children, um, you know, big, big family, uh, and the family values uh, that we have that I grew up with really provided me a, a foundation you know, for coming into NOAA and, and being a leader. And, and I, I need to kind of provide that context before I start. Um, my, my parents are the, uh, the son and the granddaughter of European immigrants uh, that came to this country uh, looking for opportunity. Uh, they, they valued responsibility, hard work, uh, respect for others, uh, and, and continuous learning. Uh, continuous learning was, was really important for them. Even though neither got college degrees, all of their children have college degrees, uh, and many of us have advanced degrees, all, all successful in our, our own right. But it really stems back to them valuing opportunity, hard work, and providing for us so that we could go out and, and uh, you know, learn and, and make our way uh, in this great country. So I started uh, in, in the NOAA Corps right after I graduated uh, college from the University of Illinois. And, and at first it was, hey, this is a great adventure. I, I want to travel. I want to uh, you know, see the world. I basically had about a five-year plan that, you know, I'll, I'll go out to sea. I'll go back to shore. I'll, I'll do some great job. I'll get my graduate degree, and then, then I'll see what's going to happen. Well, I loved it. I was, you know, I really enjoyed learning to drive a ship, to navigate, to operate a radar. Uh, I, I really enjoyed learning about what we were doing. That first ship, uh, the deep sea oceanography, the maintaining of the tower ray in the Pacific, the exotic port calls, uh, uh, you know, in both the Atlantic and the Pacific Ocean uh, were, were great for a, a recent uh, college graduate. Uh, and I, I learned how that data was being used uh, to, to monitor the ocean, how it affected climate. Um, you know, I, I continued that uh, at uh, the Northwest River Forecast Center in Portland, where I did get my graduate degree. Uh, and I learned how to forecast, uh, you know, water supply, uh, flooding, uh, and, and then helped with calibration of all the watersheds using a new model. Uh, the 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 hydrograph on the right in the right corner there is part of my graduate work to develop a consumptive use operation for uh, the Weather Services River Forecast System. And then I, I went back to sea uh, on the Oregon II as an operations officer. And, you know, there I, I learned more about fisheries, ground fish surveys, plankton surveys, marine mammal, how do we, and, and how those were used to inform our, our, our our fishery service, uh, what kind of stock assessments, how they were changing over time, who has provided those. All of this was, was incredibly valuable, exciting, um, 
and it really got me to a point where I was, you know, hey, I want to do this for a while. I, I want I want to stick around. Now, if you if you think about uh, leadership at this time, I, I didn't really have any formal leadership training, even though I was in the NOAA Corps. It was it was really about leadership by example. I was watching. I was watching. I was learning. Uh, and I, I really had a great first CEO who became a very trusted mentor uh, over all, all the years. Um, and he taught me first and foremost, respect everybody on the ship. You can learn from everybody that's here. And, and I hold that uh, true today. I think that was one of the most valuable uh, lessons. He looked out for me from that very, very first assignment, that very first ship. And I, I'm, I'm not sure where I'd be if, if he had not done that. Um, at all of these assignments, I had supervisors who I, I learned a great deal from. One story on the, my first uh, or second captain on the Oregon II, he insisted that before he would sign my annual performance review, that I put together a bio and a resume to submit to my officer folder. Um, I was like, well, why do I need to do that? He's like, this is your chance to advocate in your personnel file when you go up for promotion. Uh, I, I, I didn't realize that, but he had been part of promotion boards and he knew what needed to be done to advocate for people, to put you on a, on a, in the best possible position in order to be promoted and to move ahead in the organization. I would have never known. These are things I did not know but those mentors provided those valuable lessons that then I passed on later in my career. The next step in my career was to, to do a couple of management positions. Uh, first at, in OAR at the Atlantic Oceanographic and Meteorological Laboratory, uh, and then as XO on the NOAA ship Gordon Gunter. Uh, the NOAA Corps did have requirements for promotion to take courses in supervision, labor relations, budget, but this was really my first time as a supervisor, as uh, managing a budget, doing purchasing, contracting, moving grants around in the organization. So I built some of that management expertise in these assignments. Um, and I also started to grow others, so the, the more junior officers than me. This is my first experience, and um, I would teach them. And as I look back, uh, many of them have had commands of their own uh, as of today. So I'm, you know, that was part of my role, part of what I did. Again, it was still it was still on the job training for leadership by example. It wasn't uh, there was no formal leadership training at this point. It was still. Emulate what you what you thought worked well, and don't emulate what you didn't. Um, but I had some good mentors, and I had some uh, you know really good supervisors. I continue to keep in touch with them, and you'll you'll see that that mentor statement is in a lot of my slides, and is one of the themes uh, that continues throughout my career. Now I'm sure one of those mentors whispered in the ear of uh, one of the admirals uh, at, at headquarters and said, you need to get, uh, uh, you need to get Mr. Pika up to, uh, to Washington, D.C. My whole, whole career to this point had been uh, up in, uh, been out in the field, collecting data for NOAA, supporting the mission in the various areas. Um, and, and they said, nope, you're coming up here. Uh, I've got a position for you in the Office of the Administrator working for the Program Coordination Office. Um, wow, what, a, what an opportunity. I had no idea. Again, I had no idea what I was missing. I, it was really the first time I gained a full appreciation of NOAA's scope from the surface of the sun to the bottom of the ocean. Um, you know, the first things I learned was where all the money was. Uh, you know, appropriations, how much we spent on satellites, uh, where, how many people were in NOAA, how big the weather service was, uh, how many fisheries regulations go to the Department of Commerce for approval. Um, 
you know, quite, quite expansive and quite, quite a team. I mean, I, actually, I'll say what, what a team it was to work with that group. Uh, the picture on the, uh, this picture is that, that PCO team that I worked with, probably one of the, the highest performing teams I've, I've ever been on, um, that, that we worked together. And it's where I was also first introduced to leadership as an expertise. Uh, we worked as a group and we did things like, uh, everyone took the Myers-Briggs type indicator, if you've ever heard of that, but basically a little bit of personality but we, we used it to say, well, who works best together? How do we work together? We actually started to, to look at that. This really started to stretch some of my interpersonal and collaborative skills. Uh, and, and it really brought value to high, the peers and professional network. How do, how do we work together? Um, I'm so glad that some of my mentors arranged uh, for me to have this opportunity. And then they supported me in the, the NOAA's Leadership uh, Competencies Development Program, where I even got a, a bigger dose of leadership as an expertise. Tools, not beyond the Myers-Briggs assessment, but 360 degree assessments. Um, other training tools that assess your capability and preferences for solving problems. Um, working on the soft skills in ways I didn't, I didn't even know these existed. It was a, a tremendous opportunity. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll tell a, a, a short story. Of one of the opportunities in the program is to do details. And I got an opportunity to do a detail, or at least interview for a detail, with the president's science advisor. Well, I let, I let the director, Noah Kaur, know. And the first thing he said is, I want you in my office here next week, the day before, you've got to go interview. I want to see your materials and we're going to do a practice interview. Now, I was like, okay, great. Um, and he put me through the ringer. Uh, he, he asked me some really difficult questions to, to prepare me for that interview should they, should they arise. Um, you know, basically, are my intentions true? Uh, are, are they not? And I went in, I think, we're very well prepared. Now it turned out that he'd also assigned any prospective senior leaders in the NOAA Corps uh, to, to read a couple of books. Uh, one that was about the exploring expedition of 1848 uh, and, and the command of that, that expedition, which is the basis for uh, the United States claim in Antarctica. And it turns out that that's what I discussed with the president's science advisor during my my interview, and it was very, it was not contentious, uh, but it's very interesting. Uh, but I've, I've taken that lesson from that mentor to help others prepare for interviews, to evaluate their materials when they're applying for jobs, that that, that was part of the value uh, that the director gave to me that I've tried to provide to others. So one of the things that, that, that I found very interesting in this, this whole experience, uh, very transformative for me to understand leadership as an expertise. Um, and, and not that you, you had to be a, a senior executive or an admiral, but anybody could do this. And so I said, how do I, how do I share this with everybody? Why doesn't everyone know uh, how this would work? And so I worked uh, following that experience with the director of the Commission Personnel Center and the, and the director of, uh, of, of NOAA Corps to you know, change, to help change what the NOAA Corps was doing for its leadership development and make it a more formal program. And I authored the leadership development framework. And this had an assumption, because I was, I was just exposed to the executive core qualifications uh, from the Office of Personnel Management. And we made the assumption that a NOAA Corps Admiral was essentially equivalent to a senior executive. And so the senior executive qualifications should be the same as an Admiral. And so I framed those in growth. Uh, and, and you can see in the middle, it's, those are officer ranks, the 01 through 08. 
but you could substitute uh, you know, the GS scale or another scale for those that as you grow your responsibilities in an organization, your competencies uh, grow and build on each other as well. Um, and so this has been shared. This is all out there. And officers get this at the beginning of their career. As they start their training class now, they know this. Everyone's on an even playing field uh, from an equity standpoint. This is actually one of the things I most appreciate about the, the, the Leadership Competencies Development Program, LCDP, in NOAA is that you know, while we've, we've had many classes go through, I, I most appreciate what the participants have been able to bring in smaller components to the rest of the organization. I'm very fortunate at NCEI to, be, to have several individuals who've been through the program and they brought the lessons back so that others may learn and benefit from some of those uh, uh, capabilities. So the next part uh, was actually taking this and using it, uh, use these lessons, putting them into practice, um, try, some trial and error. Uh, my next big assignment was uh, the first commanding officer of the Okeanos Explorer. Uh, commissioning that, uh, working it through its paces, and then doing its maiden voyage of exploration to Indonesia. Uh, funny story, uh, this, this picture is at the end of that uh, uh, successful maiden voyage uh, to Indonesia, but we, we were putting in place a lot of uh, new technology. And so we, we went through some, some challenges. Uh, I remember briefing the Deputy Undersecretary on some of our challenges and what we needed to succeed and went through, this is from the middle of the Pacific Ocean, you know, over the satellite phone, uh, briefing her. And I remember her asking me, uh, you, you haven't included one risk, Joe, and that's what, what about you? What about, uh, what if something happens to you? And she brought up, because uh, we had a lot of risks that we were working on technologically uh, and capability-wise. And she said, what if you have a, a need to have an appendectomy and you're, you're out? Uh, what are we going to do? And I was able to respond, that's one problem we don't have because I had my appendix out when I was 15. So I think she was, uh, it was a light moment, uh, but it was, uh, uh, you know, very rewarding to actually succeed. And then, of course, the week before I was supposed to be relieved of command, the prospective commanding officer uh, had to have an appendectomy. So that's, that's the funny part of the story. Um, it all went well. And I, and I was still relieved, but I do want to address one of the items that came out of this. This was a very demanding assi assignment uh, for me, deployed for two years and 10 months. Uh, you see work-life balance in my list of what I was using or what I was learning. I would say at the end of that assignment, I was, I was burnt toast. I was, uh, uh, from a health perspective, I was not as resilient or in a place that I needed to be. And so I had to focus a little bit on that uh, in order to build back my resilience. Um, I moved to Boulder to work for NCEI, um, the place where all the data from the, the ship uh, was, uh, it was uh, being stored. I got an opportunity to go work uh, at the Deepwater Horizon uh, response uh, in charge of the subsurface monitoring unit to bring some of my capabilities, my expertise. And, and during all that, I, I, I built back up some of my resilience, uh, my health, my well being. I relied on peers a lot um, as, I, as I was doing this uh, and support. Um, but it, it also was something I'm like, if I do this again, I've got to, I've got to be able to handle the work-life balance a little bit better. Um, so then, believe it or not, 
After that assignment, I volunteered to go back and work at headquarters again for the deputy undersecretary. Thought I'd, okay, I'd, I'd worked on my, my work-life balance. I'm ready to, to, to re-engage uh, in a way that was uh, positive and still contributed. And I was able to do that. I was able to, to go back, take that challenging exci uh, assignment, uh, working for, for multiple deputy undersecretaries, um, you know, to serve all of NOAA and, and was be able to, to manage my, my balance of, uh, uh, of, of work life, uh, including, you know, being able to arrange for a couple weeks off, uh, completely, uh, to go on, on a honeymoon after I got married. So, um, pretty, pretty important, uh, to be able to do that, uh, that health and well-being is a key, key capability for all of us. Uh, to manage that and that's I, I say that in light of what we're we're going through now after a long time in remote work um, you know with the pandemic so I put that together after after leaving the the deputy undersecretary's office uh, I went out to be the commanding officer of the Ronald H Brown um, took command in Brazil um, for some may know, the history of the Ronald H. Brown is it was, uh, it's a global class ship. It had some challenges uh, with its uh, material condition, with morale of the crew. Um, you know, a few years prior to me getting on board, uh, but there were lessons learned. There were changes that were made, not just by the ship, but by the organization to support the people, to uh, listen to them about what are the ways that we can reestablish that global capacity, that global capability to do our work. And so I took over uh, in Brazil and we sailed for 45 days uh, to work the South Atlantic to do a decadal survey in the place where they were called back several years earlier. Uh, we were very successful. Uh, it was a great crew. It was a great first trip. We continued around into the Pacific Ocean and then did work uh, in the, the tower ray, restoring it from a, a, a low level back up to its functioning capabilities, working with weather service. Um, and it wasn't just a, a, a fluke. The, the ship actually kept sailing even after I was relieved of command uh, for another year and a half uh, away from home port. So that global capability was, was restored and was sustainable based on lessons learned, based on, on listening to people and then working together and even being designated as the, the ship of the year at the end of the 20, 2014. Um, a, a, another great team that I was able to be a part of and, and celebrate with. After that, I, uh, I transitioned uh, to a senior executive and, uh, you know, uh, first worked with, uh, with Weather Service and then, and then moved down to NCEI. Uh, but one thing that, that never ends is the continuous learning. You, you, you keep on going. You have to keep questioning your assumptions. How can I get better? How can I keep learning? Um, you know, how can I keep doing a better job of taking care of myself? Um, working with peers. Um, I think the biggest thing when I went to the, the Federal Executive Institute uh, at this point, uh, you know, I, I attended the Leadership for a Democratic Society and I, I, I did really ask those questions of what do I need to do to change to, to be better? Um, how can I do a better job of taking care of myself? Um, so it's sustainable, you know, in a stressful job, uh, stressful environment. Um, and I, I actually came out of that uh, experience with, with some changes to how I view leadership or what things I wanted to provide focus on. And the first was taking care of myself. Um, and I'll, I made some significant changes. I gotta, I gotta certainly thank my, uh, my wife was part of those. Um, but today I'm, I'm, uh, 25 pounds, uh, lighter than I was uh, before I attended. Uh, my cholesterol is way down. 
um, the, and, and it's sustainable. And it's because I, I change some of the things I do. Um, and it makes me more uh, capable, more resilient for handling stress and doing the things we need to do. I also focus more on relationships and then also on developing others. That it's not about me, that it really is about uh, the future capabilities and, and what people are doing. So I, I make it a point to mentor others, um, to work on developing uh, and, and talking to direct reports about what are their opportunities. So LCDP participants today, I'm a, you know, I, I continue to uh, mentor in various classes and certainly provide opportunities for developmental assignments to support that effort so we can continue to expand our capabilities uh, across the organization in a leadership role. Uh, uh, basically, how do we work better together? So why, why, why this focus? So after, after we've talked about this and as we go forward, I think the, the big thing is that the challenges are, are, are there. Uh, whether they be you know, our organization, uh, we've, the, the last two years, uh, have, have been very interesting. Uh, my career at NCEI started with a, a very long lapse of appropriation uh, where we were shut down and a year later we went into a fully remote uh, pandemic emergency environment. Um, at the first four months of this year, I found myself with a tremendous opportunity to do a, a detail uh, leading another organization in NISDIS um, the Center for Satellite Applications and Research um, that, that I'm not sure I would have had the opportunity to do if we were not in a, in a remote environment. And so how do, how, do we, how do we work with those? How do we address some of the, uh, the priorities that the administration has put forward in executive orders on diversity, inclusion, equity, climate change, uh, the rapid pace of technological change uh, that's confronting us in all these areas. And then you can see some of the, the, the charts uh, below on areas uh, you know, right now in the West uh, with regard to drought uh, and, and perspective uh, of very severe fire season. If, if there is even a season this year versus year round. Um, so the one thing that, that we, that we know we have that we can count on in our organization. And I actually want to just, uh, say uh, that our, our, our new NOAA administrator cited this in his first message yesterday, that, that our passion for what we do in NOAA is, is, is definitely there. Um, and these challenges and issues, and it's really about getting us, getting that passion focused and working together, having us all work together uh, to solve those challenges. I, I don't have the solutions for these today, but I think we do, where we can work through them if we work together and it's a, really about those leadership capabilities, bringing together all of our collective capability to, uh, to meet these challenges. So what steps do I wanna leave you with uh, to improve this, what I, what I call quote, leadership expertise uh, that, that really benefited me? And it's, it's the first is seek out a mentor. Um, and, and I probably should have an S behind it. Uh, I've had multiple. Uh, that have benefited me, that provide me information I didn't know otherwise. I, I would not have known a lot of those things that have benefited my career where folks were looking out for me. Um, and, it, and it doesn't have to be the same person. It can be short. Uh, it, it, sometimes it doesn't work out. You have to, to move on to someone else. Um, there are formal programs. It can be informal. Um, like I said, I had a, I've been very fortunate uh, in my career. Uh, to have had had good influencers uh, working with me and being able to ask them and have really good conversations about what I need to do. Uh, also, be a mentor. Um, you can't have everybody seeking mentors without anybody being a mentor. But I'll, I'll say that I get just as much out of being a mentor than as I got from my mentors because it keeps me in check of, hey, am I, am I living what I just said? Have I... Where am I falling short? Um, 
you know, am I taking a little bit of time out to think about them? So mentorship, seek them out and be one. Um, you know, pass on what you've learned. And then the, the last one has to do with the continuous learning, which, you know, that from the start of, of my presentation can always be better. But choose one way to improve on how you work with others. Uh, do it every year. You can, you can do it more rapidly, but, but at least choose one way. When I do my, my development plan, uh, I try and set a goal where I'm, gonna, I'm at least going to do one thing each year. I mentioned the, the you know, health challenges that I, I'm trying to work on. So, I, so I'm resilient, so I can do a better job, so I can absorb more stress, so I can, I can, I can be better at, at what I do. And then even recognize some of those challenges that, that others have. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll finish with a story, and it, it has to do with sustainability as, as we go, because this was, you know, as I found it very hard to sustain my work on the, the Okinawa Explorer, it was a long, long tour, and I was able to improve that. You know, my next command on the, on the Ron Brown, I still look at that today and, and look at things that, um, how, how can things be more sustainable? And I'll, I'll use two examples uh, to finish up. The first is at the Federal Executive Institute. We went, they get you into teams and they provide a scenario uh, where you all have to work together in order to accomplish the task. And one of these tasks they set up to be uh, intentionally confrontational. So at the end of the particular task that we got done, and I'm, I'm not going to get into the, the details, but at the end of the task, we got it done and we met the goal. But the teams didn't like each other at the end. And so one of the questions after the scenario was, how well do you think you would work together tomorrow on another task? And the, answers, the answer wasn't good. It was, it was that... We, we had destroyed the relationships in the, in the act of getting done what we needed to do out of expediency. And so uh, a, a little more, maybe a, a little bit more down home example would be this. I had the good fortune on Father's Day and happy Father's Day. I hope everyone had a good Father's Day for all the fathers out there. I had not seen my father in two years um, because of COVID. And I was, uh, it was a little bit of a cloud uh, over me. Of, you know, there, my parents were elderly, and I wondered if my, my kids, my young kids, would get to see them again. And fortunately, they have. But I was, for that Father's Day, I made homemade ravioli for, for my dad. You know, Italian recipe passed down. Um, but I, I was working on it. I wanted it to be perfect. And my, my six-year-old daughter came over and said, Dad, can I? Can I do this? I want to do this. Um, well, I could have said, you know, expediency. I need to get it done. We're supposed to eat on time, you know, cost schedule. And, you know, part of my role is not just to do it today, but to ensure, to get her input, to support her in being able to do it in the future. So she can make it for me someday. And so... I said the time is worth it. We'll we'll eat a little later. Uh, might not be quite as good. It was still pretty good um, because I let her do it and own some of it uh, for for part of it. And I think that if we think about that sustainability, it's not just about what we do today, what we get done today. How are we prepared and positioned? Taking a little bit of our time to position for doing it better tomorrow. Um, Think about improving that way or helping others do it uh, and mentoring. So with that, I want to thank everyone for listening. Um, I'll leave you with one of my favorite photos. Uh, I got a chance to uh, happen upon a humpback whale in Silver Bank, north of the Dominican Republic, uh, during one of my tours. I, I got to give credit to my dive buddy who actually got the picture uh, when it occurred. But with that, I will stop. And I will. Uh, federal group that you think you'd like to work in or with? I know you probably have worked with like NASA and other groups in your role at NOAA. I, 
I've actually had uh, some some re really good opportunities to work uh, uh, with other federal agencies, including NASA, um, U.S. Northern Command. Uh, when I worked in Boulder, um, we would uh, I worked on the interagency coordination group, and this was a group of federal agencies that would support U.S. Northern Command, which has North American uh, responsibilities. But for example, I would uh, go down there when they would uh, uh, work on their annual hurricane preparedness plan. And they could be called upon if, if the resources, the resource needs expand, uh, you know, were beyond the capabilities of, uh, of FEMA or state and local authorities where they could be called in to assist. So that was uh, one of those. And I, I certainly uh, remember the, the uh, motto of that group and it was, uh, um, you know, when you need a friend, it's too late to make one. Uh, and it really was about uh, preparedness and making, having relationships made in advance in order to facilitate those actions during an emergency. Um, the uh, another short story is that the director of that group happened to be the commandant of the Air Force ROTC unit at the University of Illinois when I was going to school. Okay, well, we do have a question that came in from Hernan. He was he, he had uh, let me know by uh, Gmail. He said, will you please ask Joe how we can advance diversity in senior leadership beyond an aspiration? Uh, Hernan, thanks for that question. I think we've got a, a, a lot of work to do in that area. Um, it's, it's certainly something I, I, I called out as, as one of our challenges and is, uh, has been brought up in the executive orders of the, the new administration and even in the, uh, uh, the note uh, from our, our new administrator uh, who we're welcoming back to NOAA uh, again. Um, I, I actually think that uh, we've got to double down and work on that uh, in, in many ways that you know, work towards uh, achieving the outcomes we want. Um, I think some of the things, steps we've taken are we're monitoring it, uh, we're tracking it, um, and I think where it relates into uh, my presentation on the, the continual learning and particularly the mentorship is how do we how do we get mentors? If you don't have anyone in, in senior leadership that's a mentor or someone that, that you can, can do, how, how do we over, overcome that barrier um, so that we are making sure that um, you know, minorities and, and others are, are getting up into the, the ranks and then mentoring others that see that they were successful to get up? So I think there's uh, certainly a deliberate effort we've got to make to go across some of those boundaries. I myself am, am, am mentoring, uh, you know, minority, uh, you know, personnel who are part of some of these programs as well, because I, I want them to be part of, of, of our program. It will only make us stronger, more resilient, give us better ideas as we try and meet all of these challenges going forward. Thanks again for that question, Hernan. We do have several questions. There, um, they were. I was looking in the wrong area. So, a comment first from Audrey, who says, "Thank you, very thoughtful presentation." Denise asks, "Hey, Joe, how's your bowling game these days?" <laughs> so my uh, my bowling game is pretty much non-existent, but. Uh, for those who know me, I was the captain of the University of Illinois bowling team. Uh, and my parents, my dad owned a bowling alley growing up. Um, that, that uh, uh, it has, since he's retired, it's closed down. But I was able to get a couple of the pin decks from that bowling alley that we had a wood refinisher uh, uh, put it, make into two craft tables, craft game tables uh, that I have in, in my house here uh, that the kids use to, to paint, color, do puzzles, 
Uh, so, so we still have that history, but we, uh, we stick to cornhole uh, these days. Cornhole's fun. And uh, Jesse has a question. Can you describe a personal management challenge you faced as a leader and how you successfully dealt with that? Um, thanks for that, uh, that question, Jesse. Let me think about that for a moment of, uh, you know, which, what kind of, uh, challenge I want to take, take on. Um, you know, the, the, the most difficult ones typically were the personnel ones, which I can't, um, you know, go into a lot of the details, but I do think that um, it's important that you, you stick to the values, that you acknowledge those as you're starting to address them. I will, I think one, one personnel issue that, that I had, uh, and I'll just, it, it had to do with uh, absenteeism. Uh, it was, a uh, uh, you know, even with flexible schedule, uh, not meeting some of those expectations. And I didn't, you know, worked it out, um, tried to address it. Um, there were bigger issues that were, were causing it. Um, but I worked with the HR support. I worked with the individual. The, the challenges we worked through is I while we're trying to recognize the challenges the individual had to see if we could get it corrected, which that's the assumption is, is let's see what we can do to fix this, not to say punish the individual. It's really about fixing it. It's really about getting the person back to being a contributing part of the organization. And I think it was hard uh, in, in, in this particular case, it, it, never, it never worked out and the, the individual had to leave. But I think making that fundamental assumption first gave to, to give hope. At some point, you had to cut it off. But in the end, then we hired someone to to actually do that, carry out that role, to be a part of the team, to contribute. Uh, and it was important to do that because the team was suffering too. It wasn't just about the individual, the team that they were working with. And I think I really relied on a mentor to say, hey, I'm having this issue. I'm, I'm struggling with it. Do you have some ideas? Um, and and also to 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 rise to rise above a little bit of it's this isn't personal. This is professional. Keep it professional. Keep trying to work with them to improve. But if they can't, you got to let it go. But then don't forget that the end goal. You need a healthy team environment to to work long term because this affects other people too when they see see this happening. So I think again the mentor part really provided a uh, sounding board for uh, you know, working through that, that particular case uh, that I had to work on. Thanks to, uh, again for that question. Those, those are the ones that those kind of uh, take a lot of energy out of you as well. Yeah, those are hard. Uh, Brian asks, what specific things did you find were most helpful for improving health? Um, so I, I actually am measuring what I do. Um, you know, I, I know it probably sounds a little hokey, but, uh, you know, metrics, I'm, I'm monitoring my weight. I'm monitoring body fat percentage, um, you know, once a month, not, not, uh, nothing crazy, but am I, uh, you know, where, where am I? What am I doing? What are my activities for the week? How many times am I running around with uh, uh, my kids? Uh, my daughter just won a 5K race. Well, she was first. There weren't that many candidates on the farm to do that. But um, where, where am I getting my, my exercise and addressing those? Um, listening to my wife about, hey, you need to take some time off, Joe. Uh, hey, uh, the kids run into the office and say, it's time to play with us. Uh, and I've got to figure out when to turn off my email, particularly in this environment where we're all working from home. So 
I'm, I'm listening to those. Um, and, and fortunately, I have some of those uh, controls uh, on me, like my kids saying I need to go read some Harry Potter to them or, or some other story. Thanks Great. for the question, are... Brian. Yeah, measuring is a good one, <laughs> keeping track. Amy asks, do you have any advice for being a great mentor? I think you kind of covered it, but if you have any closing points. Uh, f focus on, on listening. Um, focusing on, on, on listening uh, and understanding out of curiosity uh, and empathy, uh, not, uh, not judge judging, uh, not necessarily trying to solve things, but uh, understanding in, in, in those two areas. Okay, thanks. Joe, can you see the questions yet? That was my fault. I told you to go to the wrong area, so. Uh, I, it's cannot the little... see the, I cannot see the questions. I'm... Okay, on the, uh, the Q&A at the top, there's two buttons. Look at the, hit the button with the person with the computer screen, and that says presenter view, and I'm down to Eric. Um, down okay, now I can see him. Or Emily, I'm sorry, down to Emily, okay. And if you'll just read the question if you want to take it. Sure. Thanks. Thanks for showing me where these were. Um, uh, thanks for the question, Eric. It is when you seek out a mentor, uh, someone like you or someone very different uh, in leadership styles. Um, I, I think you might want to have both. Um, you, you don't need to have uh, one. And it, in, in usually it's, it's not someone exactly like you. It's someone who offers a perspective you may not have. Um, so I, I would I would try to do that, but it, it's someone you need to be able to connect with, not necessarily like you, but but connect with uh, is is what's worked best for me, um, and and even those I think who 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 work with me, um, you know, so that you get a, a perspective that you might not otherwise get. So I, I guess I'd probably lead toward the the latter, but you you might. You, you might need some also support with someone who's like you but has additional experience. Uh, the next question is, uh, Ryan, uh, what is your favorite aspect of being a mentor? And when do you know a mentorship will be successful as a mentor? How do you know what direction to provide? Um, my favorite part is actually seeing the growth or the, the aha moments uh, of of a, of a mentee when, when I bring something up uh, or, or that they realize something without me saying it. Uh, you know, that, that, that's very rewarding. Um, I think when the, when the questions keep coming, uh, that's when I think it's, it's successful, when there's, uh, there's some, some good back and forth. And then I do like, I like being able to set aside the time um, it, it really is that whole, take a little extra time because this is for the future. Um, so that's, that's uh, what, what, what I appreciate most about being a mentor. Uh, from uh, uh, Paul, looking back, would you have changed some of the steps you took during your career? Um, that's a tough one, Paul. I, I think, you know, hindsight is twenty twenty. I think I am who I am because of some of the experiences, some of the challenges. I probably wouldn't have focused as much on my my health and well-being if I hadn't struggled uh, or, or got to certain points in certain challenging situations. Um, so I, I, I don't think I would have. Uh, I, I certainly would have liked to have learned faster. Uh, is, is probably how I would uh, do it. But the, the other is I would, I would say, looking forward, I still have learning to do. I still have things I want to get better at. Uh, so I'm, I'm, you know, keep, keep that in mind too. It'll be a constant, continuous learning process. From Joel, uh, how do you view shadowing as a tool for personal and career development? Um, absolutely. Uh, all of uh, shadowing is, is a great way to experience, uh, uh, you know, what's a day like for a, a, a senior leader um, w without having to do the full detail with the full um, or, or a, 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 a full mentor capacity. It's really just getting a, a glimpse 
Uh, but sometimes that's a that's a way that you can do it with some senior leaders who are very willing to to let people see you or or have you in a conversation uh, that that I've benefit benefited from in the, in the past. That you know if you if you weren't in the room, how would you know how to pursue those types of situations in the future? So I'm I'm a big proponent of all sorts of capabilities. I don't think you have to go to a big program or do a long-term mentorship or, or, or detail to do a single activity. You can, you can choose small things and it, and it could be as simple as shadowing several leaders over the next few months uh, to, to get a better perspective. From uh, Christina, you mentioned to try a new skill you'd like to work on each year. Do you have anything, any specific examples you'd be willing to share? Um, sure. The, um, I, I think things like uh, uh, Hernan earlier mentioned uh, 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 improving diversity. Uh, one of the things uh, we, we've done here that, that, that his team has, has recommended was uh, unconscious bias training. Um, you know, try, try that, try something like that. Uh, some of our other teams have done uh, something called a DISC assessment, which is basically, uh, how do you work in teams? How, how do you fit together? What are the personalities? Um, where your team does it together. Um, and it's, it, it can be a very rewarding activity that, oh, so I was, I was upsetting you every time I bring this up because that's your personality. I didn't know that. Uh, and so I think those are some of the small things that you can uh, do. They don't have to be big, big fancy programs. They can be you know, a workshop um, or, or a training set like that to improve. Uh, from Bill, done any work with the Coast Guard? I'm a retired uh, uh, Coast Guard officer. Um, some Coast Guard bases were some of my favorite places to, uh, uh, to, to go in. I'd say that probably the biggest chance I got an opportunity to work with the Coast Guard was in the Deepwater Horizon uh, Incident Command Center in, in New Orleans. Uh, uh, back back in the day uh, when we were you know responding to that and I you know, up, utmost respect for them and then you know the NOAA Corps has uh, you know our training center now based at the Coast Guard Academy and so the last time I did my refresher training it, w it was up there so we have a very close relationship in NOAA with with Coast Guard uh, from Danny, how do you seek out mentors and how is that conversation approached where your mentor is mostly people you worked with? I've, I've done both. Uh, my strongest ones were those that I did work with and then our relationship as a mentor took off after, uh, after I, I left that assignment and was doing something else. Uh, but I've also done it in the more formal programs, whether it be uh, LCDP, um, where, where there's connections that are made. So like I, I put my name in as a mentor for LCDP, and so I'm on a list that anyone who applies for that program can do it. But there's also um, NOAA and, and, and some individual programs in the line offices where folks are available and make themselves available, and you can, you can get to those lists to see um, who would work. Look at, look at their bio, see what their areas of interest are, and then reach out to them for a, a conversation. Uh, next, from Rost, uh, were you more personally resilient during the Ron Brown tour as CEO? It sounded like a demanding tour as well. I, I was far more resilient. I was, uh, um, and, and, and actually that's one of the reasons it was very rewarding is that I, I, I knew where I fell short earlier in my own personal resilience and I, I, I took steps and made sure that was the case and um, it, it really helped uh, uh, I was married at the time, and my wife visited me in some of the, the foreign ports. Um, it, it was also nice to have FaceTime available, in, you know, in the in in our new society. So that helped. Uh, short funny story is that uh, I promised my parents and her parents they could come to Hawaii for the change of command uh, at the end of that tour, and I, I disappointed them with that. But they got. They get something better, and that was a, a granddaughter. So, all right. Uh, next question, Robert. How do you approach acting temporary leadership of a group? Um, 
So this this really, uh, you know, my, you know, I, I got the opportunity to do this. I had had to do it virtually like this, and and I tried to do it by uh, being open and having conversations. Um, I on the very first day I had a a, a webinar. Uh, like this, where I introduced myself, I talked a little bit about my history. It was a little shorter, and what my what I was trying to do during that detail, what my my top three priorities were. Um, but then I met with the leadership team, talked with them a little bit, my values, talked about who I am, and then I did arrange, uh, you know, to learn. I got I got briefings. I had it. I actually had a plan, you know, that I I walked through uh, for learning the organization, learning the issues. How would I address them? And even even talking to all supervisors uh, and, and leads in that, so that's that's how I approached it. And I had, I had a plan, and then I shared that plan with my successor, who was also doing an acting detail. So it's you know so there can be continuity. Um, something I learned as a NOAA Corps officer, where I would transition and transition. Uh, from Christina, also you mentioned the leadership development path that OMAO uses for officers. Are there things you think other line offices could learn and apply for civilian leadership development paths? Uh, absolutely. I, I actually think you could use the you could use the same conceptual because it's really towards the um, the, the qualifications of a, of a senior executive, the executive core qualifications. Um, you know where where you focus on at, at the beginning of your career, leading yourself, your own, taking care of yourself, working with others. Uh, interpersonal relationships, some of the basics, and then you get to leading others, leading performance and change, and leading organizations. So, it, with, with little modification, you could apply some of those same characteristics or capabilities towards a plan uh, in in the line offices. It, it uh, um, you know it, it really was meant to uh, to be equivalent to what uh, the civilian side does. From Lori, can you talk a little bit about succession planning and the fact that a large number of no employees will retire in the next five years? How to avoid losing a huge amount of institutional knowledge? You know, this is a, this is a great point, Lori, and and this is why at the end of my last you know look at my questioning my assumptions. Uh, for my leadership and the fact that I wanted to focus on developing others. It, it's really about that. It's it's really about succession planning. My story about teaching my daughter to do the, you know, to make the ravioli. Otherwise that recipe is lost, uh, you know, to future generations. I'm taking a little bit of time to do that. I think we've got to take a little time to do some of this and figure out uh, how, how we do that. And it's it's a little bit related to some of our hiring struggles, um, you know. In NOAA, I've I've, I've made it a, a priority at NCI to be uh, addressing some of that and bringing people on, and because that you got to have the people to train to do some of those things, um, you know. So you got to have the capability that's sustainable, where folks are coming on board and replacing those that retire, and and that there's a transition uh, to do that. So. Uh, 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 big issue that we need to to continue to do to make sure that we don't burn burn out people and that we're um, we continue to be successful with what we do uh, from matthew the NOAA core is a great way to introduce future executives to NOAA. how did you first hear about the core in the context of diversity how well or poorly has the core done to recruit and maintain a diverse uh, rep representation um, I, I, I didn't know, I was very familiar when I was growing up with the weather service, um, you know, and basically taking shelter when tornadoes would, would come in the, in the Midwest or the big storms. Um, the core I ran into at a job fair at the University of Illinois and thought it sounded interesting. Um, so that, that's when I heard and, and I started to investigate and then apply. In the context of diversity, I, I, I got to admit that the core has, has done poorly um, to recruit and maintain a diverse representation. Um, but I'm what I'm hopeful about, and I 
So I get this information from the Corps as a retiree that they are looking at that very closely uh, and looking at what they need to do. They're admitting it. They're looking at the metrics for how they're doing, how the how the the diversity and and gender is according to the ranks, and looking at creative solutions uh, for addressing it. Um, so the first is you got to admit you have the problem, and then you you work on it, and then even doing the NOAA Core Act, which which passed uh, uh, last year, I think. Um, there's there's some some very interesting incentives. Uh, that, that they may be able to do or use to improve that diversity. Um, uh, Brian, thanks for all the advice. A great mentor once told me 75% of the success of a leader is communication to bosses, subordinates, and constituents. Communication is one third talking and two thirds listening. Um, I, I agreed, agreed. Uh, uh, I think some of the success I had in the sustainability of the, the, the Ron Brown was listening to the crew, listening to the officers on their solution, letting them own it, not trying to do it, uh, a, a lot of it myself. And, and they took ownership of it and they bought into it. And I, I, I agree. Um, the only thing I would, I would add to the listening is you can't listen for listening sake. It's got to be listening for, out of curiosity. It's got to be listening out of empathy, um, not, not judging. Uh, from Shelby, do you have favorite resources for people who don't have access to leadership uh, development programs? Um, I, I like reading books. Uh, I like looking at stories and, and articles and, and, and books on some of these things. Um, I think uh, um, that that's a, uh, uh, you know, a, a, one way that I would, um, you know, do this if, if you don't, if you're not going to go to a program, I think I would, I would try some of those things of, of looking for a book in an area that you wanted to improve, um, you know, and, and ask, ask peers. Ask peers or, or, or mentors, what, what do you suggest? Uh, what, what type of assessment might be valuable that would be something that would be manageable that's not a big program? Let's see. I'm... Let's see. Um, I, I guess I'm just checking in with, with folks of where I am on, uh, if I've missed any questions, or that I need to go back to anything. Um, yes, there are a few up at the top that uh, I I started you a little bit too late. So there was something from Bill. You can see it near the top under Brian, and then also a question from Emily further down. Bill says excellent presentation, and then has a question. Okay. Uh, Bill, uh, what what are your future plans? Um, uh, my future plan right now is to focus on, uh, you know, being the best leader I can be in, in NOAA, uh, you know, at, at NCEI, trying to, uh, uh, you know, also integrate, integrate our data as, as best we can. I'm, I'm looking forward to attacking those challenges I showed on that second to last slide, having to do with climate change, uh, technological pace, uh, diversity, inclusion, and then and then our organizational health. What, how we're going to operate based on what we learned during during COVID, uh, so that we we can make this all sustainable. So that that's what I'm I'm focused on uh, uh, for uh, 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 the near future. Let's see, Emily, do you have any recommendations on dealing with someone on a team that is prone to ruffling others' feathers? Um, I guess uh, I, I don't have a specific recommendation, um, you know, for for the individual. But I'm wondering if if there might be some sort of team training that might be valuable. Uh, I, I mentioned the DISC assessment. I I don't recall off the top of my head what it stands for, um, but there might be some sort of training that could be done as a team to highlight 
some of the difficulties or personalities uh, uh, across the team that would make you uh, better going forward in the future and, and has potential to identify something like that that could be confronted in a in a uh, open honest way uh, w without being judging all right and if i got anything else uh, that i rudolph's comment at the bottom i think the last more one. of a comment uh, really like the story of teaching your daughter the ravioli recipe my grandfather had an amazing peach cobbler recipe but unfortunately it passed with him my mom gets the closest to it but it isn't quite the same um i i i work hard to do it at least two or three times a year uh so that i i can stay true to it but I'm also open to my daughter. She She's actually improved the recipe a little bit by adding uh, um, some ground pork to it that I, I focus on homemade ricotta, but she is she's made some enhancements and, and it helps for her to own it and want to do it more. Um, so, I, and I think her, her namesake, her, her great grandmother would approve. All right. Uh, with that, I, I, I really appreciate all the questions, everyone. Uh, a, a really good list. I'm sorry I couldn't see those initially. That it actually helped for me to see them, so I could I could run through them. And I really appreciate everyone uh, joining today, so that uh, I could I could share some of this information. I hope hope you found it uh, interesting and uh, uh, informative. That uh, you know there there's we all have struggles. We all learn. Uh, I, I would leave you with you know. Focus on mentorship, giving and receiving, and then continue learning. Um, those, how, however you do it, in small ways, uh, big ways, that we can all get better uh, as we go. And with that, uh, I will, I will uh, pass it uh, back to Sandra. Thank you, Joe. I appreciate it. everything. It was a great talk. Thank you for focusing on mentorship on both sides of the coin, not just seeking a mentor, but being a mentor as well. And for the giving and receiving, this is a great talk. Really appreciate you being here with us today. Tracy, thank you for your moderation um, of the questions and, and helping us stay uh, technically connected to the audience. And before we go, everyone, I'd like to announce our next leadership seminar, which is going to be on July 13th. And our speaker is Dr. Ramaswamy, the director of NOAA OAR's Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Laboratory. We hope you will join us then. Thank you for joining us today. Goodbye. Bye, everyone. Bye, Jim.